Hello, everyone. Today on the Final Bar, it's Friday, December 16th, our last live show of 2022. We'll talk about the market continuing its distribution phase through much of the day. Bit of a bounce into the close, but overall, another week day and a week week. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is uh, combining elements of price, breadth, sentiment, trend, momentum, all of those inputs with the goal of helping you or empowering you to uh, better understand the investment landscape, to make better decisions of your own, to better identify potential opportunities and uh, mitigate potential risks. We have a lot of ch charts to talk about here in our li last live show of 2022. We've got a special series next week with the top five charts of 2022. But today we're going to talk about sort of how this week has wrapped up. Sort of the Friday show is an opportunity to look back at the last five trading days. Quite a little bit of uncertainty going into Tuesday and Wednesday with inflation data with the Federal Reserve meeting Thursday and Friday, sort of following through to the downside, sort of giving a risk off feel as we go uh, through the latter stages of December. This is when the Santa Claus rally usually tends to emerge, right? right? Even if there's a weaker period earlier in December, the end of the year, uh, in the end of the month, usually tends to be fairly strong. January, usually a seasonally weak part of the year. We'll look at some of those charts here to together today and uh, focus on some of the movements we can identify going into the weekend. We have great guests on the show and a lot of great content. Really excited to share with you uh, what is coming up. And uh, this time, the schedule is pretty uh, straightforward because the final bar is taking the next couple of weeks off. We're taking a holiday schedule break, uh, going time uh, time with our families to, uh, to uh, recover from this week or from this year. Enjoy the holiday season. We'll be back with you live the first week in January. Did want to let you know about a special series we will start on Monday, this coming Monday. I'll be sharing with you the top five charts of 2022. Each day, we'll unveil the next chart. We'll share with you what it means, how it's constructed, why it's important, what it tells you about 2022, how you can learn the lessons of the year through those five charts, but also how they can help you better prepare for what's coming next. So don't miss starting on Monday, uh, the uh, 19th of December, we'll have the top five charts of 2022, a new one uh, every day. And we'll rerun those the uh, last week of the year. Again, we'll be back with you uh, live after the uh, the new year. Let's continue on our show today. Two main goals today. Let's wrap the week by focusing on the weekly movements and the weekly evolution of this market. After the break, we'll come back with the final bar mailbag, our last mailbag of the year, answering some of your questions that you sent in uh, this week. Starting off with a poll that when I asked you recently, January tends to be one of the strongest months for stocks. Will January 2023 be a positive or negative month for the S&P 500? Two out of every three of you said negative, saying uh, that'll be a negative move for the S&P as opposed to 38% of you that said uh, positive. Let's look at our chart of the S&P 500. Think about what that actually uh, means, right? So we'll see where De December ends up. And I think that's one of the big question marks, right? Is we've got a couple of weeks left here. The holiday season, particularly between Christmas and New Year's, tends to be a little lighter in terms of volume. Certainly, certainly tends to be a little stronger than weaker, uh, again, on average. But uh, you know, my episode, uh, latest episode of the pitch that we recorded this week, a uh, great conversation, by the way, with Larry Tentarelli, Katie Stockton, and Dave Landry. You can find that on our YouTube channel and on Stock Charts TV On Demand. We had a really good conversation. One of the things that came out was just the seasonality. And I forget if it was Katie or Dave that made this point, but it was a reminder that seasonal tendencies are just that. They're tendencies. They're not absolutes. There's no guarantee that December is going to be a positive month, just like there's no guarantee that January is going to be a negative month. Even though that's what the averages would tell you, there are outliers every time. And as a reminder of that, just look back in 2021 versus 2022. Did sell in May and go away work well in 2021? Absolutely not, because March, May through November was actually fantastic. Did sell in May and go away work very well in 2022? 
Arguably not so much, right? Because from May to November, it was actually flat. Market was actually up a little bit from mid-May to uh, to mid-December so or mid-November. So, you know, these are just tendencies. But it's again, it's a general uh, thing I like to keep in my mind, uh, that cyclicality of the market as I'm looking at the trends. At the end of the day, it's what the charts tell us. And when I'm looking at the chart of the S&P 500, we're in a downtrend, right? We've been in a downtrend for most of this year. We appear to continue to be in that downtrend. The way I can declare that with some sort of confidence is because this most recent rally from October to November has now appeared to uh, have stalled out here. We have attempted to get above the 200-day moving average a number of times in the last four weeks. We have now failed that attempt twice with meaningful moves above the 200-day only to be repelled and soon after we close right below the 200-day. This trend line, this green trend line I'm illustrating, highlighting the high in January, how that connects to the high in March, which connects to the high in August, which connects to the highs that we've seen in November and December. Just one of the most beautiful ways of illustrating the simple fact of this is a market in a distribution phase. Now, why is that trend line so meaningful? I'll tell you why. Because the more we test it, the more it further validates that that is the upside definition. That is the upside boundary of this downtrend. We're in a downtrend channel. So not only does it define the framework of this move lower, but also gives you a sense of if and when the downtrend may be done. Until we break above that trend line, the trend is still down, right? Because no matter what noise happens underneath the trend line, until you break it, that trend line, that, that definition of the downtrend is still intact. So going into the end of the year, going certainly into the new year, that is a line I would be watching because, again, until we break it, the trend by definition is uh, is lower. Let's uh, continue on looking at the wrap the week segment. Actually, uh, as we continue on, let's look at the uh, market today, and then we'll connect it to the market returns over the last week, and then we'll finish off looking at the mindful investor live chart list. So what happened on Friday session? Sell-off in the morning was the big story, sort of stabilized midday, a bit of a rally going into uh, the last hour of trading. But overall, the S&P finishing down just over 1%, underperforming the NASDAQ composite, which is down right about 1%, the Dow down about 0.9%. So everything down about 1% for the day. The VIX also moving lower. So if I remember right, I think four out of the, the five days this week, the VIX and the S&P have moved together. Normally, they would move against one another. Uh, people have reminded me, obviously, this is a, uh, a quad witching day or triple witching day today. I forget. I think it's a quad witching day. And so there's a lot of options expiration. The options market gets a little crazy today because there's a lot of rollover and a lot of, uh, a lot of volume that's just kind of structural volume as people re-up their bets and, and sort of rotate positions as contracts uh, expire. However, for whatever, for whatever reason, I was taught that the S&P and the VIX move inversely. And let's just remember this week, it's been the opposite. The S&P and the VIX have moved together. However, the VIX remains above 20, which remains a, a cause for concern. Uh, interest rates moving, uh, sort of chopping around for quite uh, for quite some bit of the day, to be honest with you. But overall, the 10-year yield higher than it closed yesterday. Uh, end of the day, we're around 345. We're about 348. Got as high as 355 earlier in the day, but 10-year yield finishing uh, a little bit higher, about 30 basis points higher than yesterday. The dollar index moving up, but not by much. It wasn't a huge uh, upswing for the dollar. Commodities, you have gold and silver in the green. Most of the other commodities were in the red, uh, particularly energy prices moving lower with crude oil, uh, natural gas, gasoline uh, futures all moving to the downside, the ETFs as well. Cryptocurrencies all in the red. So if you're looking for a sign of uh, risk on by an improvement in the cryptocurrency charts, you didn't get it today. Bit of a bounce yesterday, going uh, you know after the U.S. equity close. But uh, end of the day, Bitcoin down three percent today. Ether down five percent, actually hitting that twelve hundred level, which is an important one. That's one we've uh, talked about a number of times here. So very quickly in two days, we've gone from thirteen hundred down to twelve hundred. Uh, so my, you know, what would it take to be bullish on cryptocurrencies? My short answer would be they stop going down. Right. Remember one of my. Uh, one of the the uh, analysts I used to follow, Paul Montgomery, who no, uh, unfortunately passed away a number of years ago, he wrote a newsletter called Universal Economics over 50 years and uh, still sort of, uh, I think it was sent over email, but it used to be faxed. It was faxed way past faxing newsletters. It was a thing that you probably should have done as a new newsletter uh, distributor. But uh, Paul's comment was the most bullish thing the market can do is go up, uh, flip that over. And this is what the problem I have with cryptocurrencies. The most bearish thing the market can do is go down. And I would say that that is what we have seen most recently. Looking at what we call our wrap the week chart. This is just looking at the last five trading days and what has happened uh, with these major asset classes. This is looking at 
Uh, the S&P 500 in black, that is the line down here. The S&P finishing the week in the negatives, uh, down 2.1%. So a negative move uh, through the course of this week. Only one of these uh, asset class ETFs that we track uh, underperforming the S&P, and that's the NASDAQ 100, which is down 2.8%. Everything else outperformed large cap stocks this week. And from the bottom, we have in purple small caps, the IWM, which was down right around 2%, so about the same as the S&P this week. In orange, we have emerging markets, which are down 1.7%. Uh, close to that, we have Bitcoin, which is down 1.6%. Gold and the US dollar actually finished almost at a wash for the last five trading days, both down about 0.2% for the week. And that's using the UUP for the dollar and the GLD for gold. A couple of things were up uh, on, uh, on an absolute basis this week. Bond prices using the TLT were up about 1%. And in brown, we have crude oil uh, using the USO ETF, which tracks the crude oil uh, futures contract pretty well. That was up 3.3%. So the biggest gainer, actually, crude oil uh, this week. Let's finish off looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is a list of charts that I keep updated on the Stock Charts platform. You can access those from my blog. So if you click on the Articles tab, go to... Uh, the Mindful Investor, which is the name of my blog. There's a gray button at the top that says Live Chart List that'll get you to this list of charts, which I keep updated. Now, and usually every Friday, I go through and make sure they're all uh, updated with my latest uh, indications and latest thinking here. My market trend model combines a series of exponential moving averages using weekly data to define the trends on three different timeframes. The short-term timeframe, very loosely for me, is a couple of days to a couple of weeks. The medium term is a couple of months uh, out. And the long-term trend is uh, one year plus, generally speaking. And again, those are loose definitions. I, I'm not super hard and fast with the timeframes, but I found I was often looking at the chart of the S&P and trying to answer those questions. What is the S&P trend on those timeframes? And I found this combination of moving averages that helped me do that in a very systematic way, which allows me to look at this market trend model on uh, individual stocks, which I do uh, occasionally, but more for different asset classes, not just large cap equities. By my definition on those timeframes, the long-term uh, trend model remains negative. It turned bearish uh, at the end of April of this year, uh, beginning of May, has remained bearish through this uh, through this phase. The medium-term model, not quite negative. It's actually remaining narrowly positive, but really, really close. As we sold off earlier in this week, I was watching this to see if we turned negative. Didn't quite get there. The short-term model actually turned bearish last week and remains bearish uh, again this week. So at this point, my market trend model says long-term bearish, medium-term bullish, short-term bearish. And that's pretty much how I would see this uh, overall market. I should tell you, of course, when the market trend model, my medium-term model turned bullish at the uh, beginning of November, I did one of those really probably silly things, which is say, look, my main risk on model is turning risk on, but I'm super skeptical. And uh, to my premium members of market misbehavior sort of outlined the reasons why uh, that was the case. And, you know, so far it appears to be vindicated or validated by the market rolling off of uh, those swing highs in November. I see downside for stocks in the first half of next year, particularly January coming out of the new year. And so I'm not surprised to see the weakness now, because I would argue the story is the Fed, and the Fed has indicated their interest in moving, uh, you know, of, of basically addressing inflation by moving uh, moving the markets uh, lower and, and, and moving rates higher to address inflation. I have a new version of the chart. Uh, you'll have to tune in to our year-end uh, program, the top five charts of 2022, because that is one of them. And I want you to check out that uh, video. That's actually one of the five that we'll unveil next week. But I took the, uh, the chart that I've used through the course of 2022 and updated it with a couple of new series and reordered some things around. So check that out if you want to get the uh, the latest uh, indication there. So I'll finish off my wrap the week segment with this chart here. This is a look at breadth using the bullish percent index. The S&P 500's bullish percent index has gone above 70 four times in 2022, once in January, once in March, once in late July, and once in early November. Now four times it has gone back below that 70 level, once in early January, once in early April, once in mid-August, and now the fourth time in early December. We had a bit of a head fake getting back above 70%, but we're finishing the week almost down to 50%, which I would argue is a confirmed bearish sign. This is giving us the sell signal that the bear market rally has played out and we're rolling over. So despite the seasonal strength, I'm seeing weakness increase in measures of market breadth. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back, back asking your, answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. See you in a minute. <laughs>
everyone. Welcome back to the final bar. This is Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. It has been a blast to do the show in 2022. It has been an adventurous year with a lot of really good conversations and crazy markets to try to dissect with you. Glad that you've joined us along the way. We have a lot of really good plans for the show in the new year. Excited to introduce you to our new studio, which is where the final bar will be hopefully soon after the new year, kind of getting everything finished up as we uh, head into the holiday season. A couple quick announcements before we continue on today's show with the uh, final bar mailbag. First off, the mailbag is driven by your questions. We'll be off for the holidays, but our mailbag will remain open. And when we get back in the new year, we will be very much hoping to answer some of your questions. So please keep them coming. You can email us your questions at the final bar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at final bar SCTV. And we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions and we will answer yours, hopefully, in our first mailbag of 2023. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. When I look back at 2022, I was talking with Greg Schnell earlier, one of our contributors. We we're talking about the markets and just kind of checking in on what we were both uh, seeing and hearing. He is sharing my concern about downside potential for risk assets, particularly equities going into uh, to the new year. But it reminded me how fortunate we are at Stock Charts and at Stock Charts TV to have people like Greg who have been using technical analysis successfully for many, many moons, sharing their expertise with you. Conversations with Ms. Schneider, with Tom Boley, with Katie Stockton, with Larry Tentarelli, with Dave Landry, with Larry Williams, and many, many more are all available for you for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let's continue on our show today with our last mailbag of 2022, the final bar mailbag, and let's get to question number one. Dave, does the fact that SPY is trading at or just below the 200-day moving average for an extended period, as opposed to the immediate rejection in the past few bear market rallies, mean anything to you? Really good question. I think what you're getting at is sort of this uh, phenomenon, right? This is the SPY for the last two years. We have the 200-day moving average. We see these uh, frequent tests and failures to get above the 200-day moving average. Your point is, um, is the fact that we've sort of been, I guess what I would describe, you said trading at or just below, I would, we'd call that hugging the moving average, which is the, the shorthand for it's kind of right there. Uh, and that's kind of a common thing. I remember uh, talking with John Bollinger years ago about, you know, hugging the bands, or what do you call riding the bands when price would uh, would uh, would ride the, uh, the market higher, ride the market lower. Um, we sort of, uh, you know, sort of um, you know, it's a way of, of recognizing the fact that the price often gravitates to that particular level, and then we'll sort of stick with it. Um, you know, so does that have meaning? I don't know if it's if it has meaning that it's sort of trading at around it, but I would say that every time you test and fail to get through a key level, that sort of makes it more valid. That's why the trend line off of the 2022 highs, I think, is more and more significant because it's a reminder that. We're testing resistance and we're failing to get above there. I think the same thing is idea uh, ideal um, or is, is uh, relevant for moving average resistance, right? When you keep testing the 200-day and failing to sustain any move above there, every time that happens, I would argue that sort of further questions the upside potential because it's a constant reminder that the buying power you would need, the momentum, the influx of buyers that would cause prices to go higher is just not there. And we keep stalling out. So every time we keep stalling out, that's just reinforces, I think, a lack of upside momentum. So I think in that case, absolutely, that's a, that's a challenge. So November and December, I don't see that as a particularly bullish development. I see that as a confirmation of the bearish phase that we've been in pretty much for the entirety of 2022 and potentially going into the uh, first quarter of next year. Next question, how do you create the seasonality charts you showed earlier this week? That's a really good question. I had a couple different charts that we looked at, and I'm thinking what you're asking about is the seasonal chart I'm about to show you. So at the top, um, it defaults to what's called sharp chart. If you're using the, uh, the the traditional stock charts window in ACP, it's a little different. But in uh, in our traditional sort of sharp chart charts environment, at the top, I would encourage you to click on that and select some of these other items. So you can easily create an RRG by just typing in different symbols. You can put a candle glance by just typing up ups and symbols. It's a great way to just look at, if you wanna compare three to five different things, you can just select from it there and just uh, pop it on the, on the top. That's exactly how you do seasonality as well. So if you do seasonality SPY, it's going to bring in, uh, run our seasonality engine. It sort of defaults this particular structure, which is looking at the last five years, separating a histogram by month, and the uh, numbers tell you the hit rate. So what percent of the time we finish that month 
higher on average for the last X number of years. And then the little numbers at the bottom of each bar uh, tells you the average return, just the mean return for that month going back through those observations. I like to bring in as much as possible. But what this allows you to do is say, all right, just since the 2009 lows, maybe start in 2010, which is more of like a longer bullish phase, or go all the way back 20 years, which takes you back to 2003, which means you've got some bull cycles and some bear cycles all kind of mixed together. In general, I think the more data, the better, because that allows you to think about the robustness of these uh, trends through different cycles, right? Is it just a bullish or bearish uh, cycle kind of phenomenon, or is it sort of consistent across case? By looking at different time frames, you really want to get into it, uh, you can do some really cool stuff. And then you can also say, no, I want to look at the relative strength of the XLK versus uh, XLP or SPY or whatever comparisons you want to do. This is a really interesting way to look at two different stocks, to look at uh, sectors versus ETFs, all sorts of different things, but can be a really helpful way of understanding some of those cyclical patterns that we often talk about here, you can actually get to some of the raw data and dig into it a little bit further. Thanks so much for that question, by the way. Next one, has stock charts ever tracked the performance of the top scooter stocks? I love this question so much. So if you go to charts and tools and go to scooter reports, we have a full listing. And just to remind you what the capabilities are, we have eight different universes of stocks and ETFs that we run uh, every trading day. And actually, these update during the day. We have our... Um, database team uh, updating these scooter rankings because it is based on the trends as defined by the best practices of technical analysis on three different time frames long term medium term short term the, the eight universes are us large mid small cap stocks another one for us etfs and a separate one for us industry groups then we have one for canada one for the uk and one for india so if you trade those particular markets we have the local stocks uh, ranked by their scooter rankings and it's a percentile ranking so the higher the number the better it's performing within that group and we, and we do those separately because obviously each of those groups have their own sort of nuances and by uh, if we mix them together it's kind of an apples to oranges type of thing this will make them very very similar if you want to understand the scooter reports better the scooter uh, analysis better if you click on the little uh, magnifying glass type sctr you'll get a chart school article where we share the formulas behind it uh, we're very upfront it's a proprietary model but uh, we share with you the calculations we're using because the benefit i think is that it highlights how momentum-based investing and how charts can help you understand what's happening and focus on the big opportunities your question have we tracked the performance? So the short answer is yes. The longer answer, which is, have we done it in a way that you can see and really dig into? No. And I'll tell you, when they originally designed the scooter rankings, this is before I was part of Stock Charts many, many uh, years ago, uh, they did some testing, came up with this model, and uh, and started building it out to the universes and to the settings that we have. We have tweaked the model over time. And actually, just last year, we tweaked the model a little bit because during the COVID experience, some weird things started to happen. And so we reevaluated and made a couple changes, particularly in the universes, just of, in terms of how we were allocating stocks between those universes. One of the things on my our data team's uh, uh, to-do list, and uh, pretty much at the top of the list in terms of priority on top of adding options data, which we have just done this week, if you missed that announcement, uh, adding additional options analytics, futures, commodities, cryptocurrency data, currency data. Uh, we have some of all of those. We're going to build it out even more. And fundamental equity data, building out our universe there. We also are going to be looking at the scooter rank is something we've started to dig into. Part of that will be creating some uh, some really cool tests. So I'll be excited to share with you the results of what we've done there. Uh, and at some point, maybe you have the ability to buy an ETF that allocates to the scooter stocks. Who knows what the new year and beyond may, uh, may hold. But thanks so much for that question and your interest in the scooter rankings. Next question, probably the final question. Could you start covering emerging markets with the US dollar down? It might be time for EM to pick up steam. And I love the the point and the 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 insights you embedded in your question there, right? Um, you know, the the reason, if you ask me why I haven't talked about emerging markets more on the final bar in 2022, it's because of this chart right here, right? This is my dollar chart, the US dollar index. You know, the US dollar in 2021 was choppy, but in the first half of the year was more range bound. At the end of the year, it really started to break out in November, just as equities were sort of continuing their uptrend. Uh, you saw that happen with uh, with the dollar as well. 2022 was just off to the races with the dollar index, uh, the dollar so strongly outperforming all of the currencies, right? And if you measure other currencies versus the dollar, it was the dollar uh, stronger than pretty much everything else. So it just didn't behoove US-based investors, in my opinion, to look outside the US because any gains you would have gotten from brilliant movements 
in stocks in India or Brazil or Vietnam or wherever you might be looking, any of those gains you would have had from the equities would have gotten completely written off, if not much more, from the currency difference, right? So you trade your, you know, your great gains in local Indian stocks and you convert your uh, rupees back to dollars and all of a sudden you've given back all of those gains because the uh, the, the dollar sort of dominated uh, non-US currency or the global currencies. That has certainly started to change. And I know with my premium um, premium members at Market Misbehavior, we've talked a lot more about non-US stocks in the fourth quarter, talked about the potential of the dollar to roll over even further or what a stronger dollar environment might do. I think the biggest question for that is what happens to this chart here. I'm highlighting a trend line from uh, mid-2021, early 2022, you can see it's just below the lows that we experienced this week. If that line holds, we rotate back above the 200-day, I would say EM is probably going to be a really tough place to be. But if we break that trend line, there's further downside for the dollar and certainly would mean non-US markets would be of, interesting, of interest for sure. I enjoyed very much traveling to India this fall. And I will tell you, if you ask me, which markets have looked strongest. I think India has been one of the stronger places to be. Uh, the Indian ETF has come off uh, a little bit here in the last uh, week or two. And I think there's key resistance in INDA around 44, 44, 50. Other um, uh, global ETFs like Germany and others recently broke out, but this week kind of coming back along with everything else. This is going to be a play based on the dollar. I would separate your analysis of the ETFs and of the local markets with your analysis of the dollar. Focus your attention there. And I think you're, uh, whether or not you have an international allocation that grows or shrinks should probably be dictated by the, dictated by the dollar more than anything else. We need to wrap the show and wrap our live programming for 2023 with the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one, the biotechnology index. We had our special, uh, our latest episode of The Pitch, uh, which aired earlier today at 9 a.m. Eastern. If you missed it, you can go to stockchartstv.com. I had a really good conversation with Larry Tantarelli, Katie Stockton, and Dave Landry. A lot of great lessons learned from 2022, a bit of a look forward to 2023. And one of the ideas was in the biotech group in the healthcare sector. We talked about the strength in healthcare, which has certainly been one of the uh, impressive rotations uh, in the second half of the year, kind of taking the place of things like energy that stalled out quite a bit. I was noticing the relative strength in the biotechnology sector uh, earlier today. This is dollar sign BTK relative to the SPX. If you look at the bottom series, from the summer to the end of the year, look at how biotechs have continued to improve. So higher on an absolute basis, more importantly, higher on a relative basis in general. Focus on areas of the market at any point where the relative strength line is improving. Those are the areas of the market that are generating better returns than the passive benchmarks. That is where you're going to earn uh, your uh, uh, the, the investment you make in active management is going to pay off if you're in things that are outperforming the passive benchmarks. Chart number two is the chart of Bitcoin. Bitcoin, Ethereum, both with pretty impressive 2021s and very dismal 2022s. I've been asked recently what the outlook is for Bitcoin. And, and my number one comment with cryptocurrencies is the most important thing is for them to stop going down. And we've had a number of times where we've had meaningful bounces. And these green trend lines highlight some of those ones that we've experienced. I could do another one here in September and October. A number of these times we've had uh, you know, a higher lows in the short term. We've had the, uh, the price move above its most recent swing high. But look how we failed a breakout in March. We failed a breakout in June. We failed a breakout in August. We now failed to break out in uh, November. Now we're arguably failing to break out in December as we stall here at the 50-day moving average. Support here is just below 16,000. That's the low from November. But notice how the momentum has been in a bearish range for most of the last eight months. Final one is UHS. Let's finish the year and finish the show on a positive note as a reminder, healthy reminder, there are always stocks or ETFs somewhere that are breaking out. Use the scanning engine, use the alerts, to identify those names where the opportunities are emerging. A chart like UHS is working. Debate why it's working, how it's working, whatever. I like charts that are going up, and UHS in mid-December appears to be fitting the bill. Folks, that's a wrap and a wrap for 2022 on the final bar. Have a fantastic holiday season. I'm Dave Keller with StockCharts.com. We'll see you in the new year. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.